Welcome back to the charismatic voice. I recently found out about a Led Zeppelin song that one of my favorite artists, Jeff Buckley, was last seen singing moments before he died. By the way, if you haven't seen my Deconstructing Jeff Buckley video, it is on our sister channel, The Singing Hole. Highly recommend it. I'll link to it at the end. But right now, I need to hear the song and understand not only more greatness about Robert Plant, but also how that influenced Jeff Buckley. So let's get to it. the drive and energy that this immediately started out with. It just has like a really fun rhythmic guitar riff that feels like it's pushing forward right away. And then the drive in Robert Plant's voice is also pushing forward. It, it really feels um very needy in a lot of ways. Oh, I'm going to go back to the beginning. <laughs> I love their interaction. <laughs> what a reason here too. go back back to a lot of these vocal entrances and talk about the connection that he's using that is just so divine. That's cool. I like that. It, so listen, there is a vowel that's placed before you so the first actual word is you, but there's a you need that happens in there. And he's doing this partly to kind of hook up into his support system. You need to One more time. You need to if you slowed it down, you would see that there's, it's almost like a shadow valve that's placed ahead of the consonant and said, a you need. And that helps to get things rolling, essentially. The vocal folds have started to vibrate already at that point. That hooks into the sound. It's a great way to get the whole system flowing. But if you're going to do that, you need to be very deliberate about where you place the pitch of that little shadow bell that comes ahead of time. He's deliberate. He's just incredible in what he's doing here. It fits all within the same style. I've heard people do this where they accidentally have these sort of pre-shadow vowels that are on pitches that don't fit within the musical uh, harmonic frame, if you will. One more time. It almost feels like it's an echo of the away, a you. It, it feels like he's drawing some similarities between that and all the ways he's starting these phrases. I love the ending too. Each one's like a kiss. Oh. I am good, 
love the way that we're getting so many different extra sounds. They feel so organic. It's almost like there's like things that feel like they could be a hybrid between beatboxing and singing because of the way he intersperses little sounds. They're like little little grunts or moans here and there, right? It it just it feels like it's coming from deep down and is adding so much expression and style. And that adds a lot to the overall feeling, especially when so far we don't have a lot of range that's happening. Robert Plant has a huge range that's available to him, but he's choosing to stay within a fairly narrow scope at the moment and just giving it tons of style and expression. Oh, I wanna go back a little more. I, I really I really like that Zeppelin. <laughs> That way that he leans into words and then slides off of them, and sometimes we can go a little bit sharp on them deliberately, that reminds me a lot of Jeff Buckley. And I really should say that Jeff Buckley reminds me of Robert Plant at this point because Robert Plant came first. But I was introduced to Jeff Buckley a long time ago, whereas I, I didn't know Robert Plant before very recently. <laughs> I really like the way that the top pitches in here, they feel like they're hollering out. But then the bottom ones, it's just a slightly different placement that he's found on the bottom ones. And the bottom ones feel essentially more, uh, more sensual. They're a little more connected to sort of lower resonance. It feels um, more earthy, more contained within the body, whereas the top ones feel like they're kind of hollering out and asking for attention. And then the bottom pitches feel like they're a little bit more contained. And I think that it's a really, really cool way of going back and forth and highlighting some of the best parts of Robert Plant's voice already. So much slide. Ooh, whoa, whoa. Oh my goodness, that was so gutsy on the slide on the guitar too. He's got tons of sliding that's happening in his voice over and over and over. But uh, I think that's Jimmy Page who just did that really long. That was cool. <laughs> Purposely flat there. This is, this is so fascinating. I mean, the moment that we went into this, it sounded like it was going to be a drum solo for a bit, and it reminded me a little bit of Danny, Danny Carey and Tool, and the way when I first saw them in concert, Danny Carey's use of the drums just changed how he thought about drums. I suddenly, suddenly started thinking about drums with so many different kinds of pitches and timbres, and uh, like a, they almost feel like a choir of 
percussive instruments that somebody's playing. Um, John, John Bunham, Bunham, Bonham. I'm not sure how to say his last name. Um, drummer here. And I was thinking, aren't they both named John? The other two people I don't talk about as much. John Paul Jones, bass, John Bonham is drums. Uh, I am so fascinated by what he's doing here. The way he's creating, um, it almost feels like world music in the way that we're going into these different pitches and the toms. I'm gonna go back, back further. Such a beautiful mellow timbre. Oh, it's like a different kind of drum he's playing. Oh, there's just small toms or might be something else. I might be calling that wrong. And then we have this other sound. Is that Jimmy Page or is that the other John? Oh my gosh. So much sliding, so much distortion. It's not focusing on any single pitch. It's like it's so exploratory. And then the sound. This feels to me like we've gone into some sort of like primitive drum circle and we're experimenting with an instrument that isn't really exactly pitched as well. So we've got the drums and we have, it almost feels like some primal sounds that Robert Plant has added in here. They're not even as I would expect in contemporary music uh, on a specific rhythm that's, that's uh, they are on a specific rhythm, but it's not one that you would normally hear in contemporary music. Uh, he goes a little outside of the current time signature. And in addition, the sliding of the pitch in the background, that's what feels to me like uh, an instrument that maybe is not necessarily in our current uh, tuning, if you will, where we've you know, we have different kinds of tunings across different uh, ethnic music, uh, different cultures across the world. We've all kind of settled into this 440 uh, specific scale, essentially, in most Western music. But there's still things like pentatonic uh, tuning that can happen and really strange bent uh, pitches that we think are strange, perhaps, in other music, but is very normal there. So this, the way it's sliding around, to me, it sounds like maybe... They're aiming for an instrument that was before we settled into our current tuning. I don't know. That might not be what they're doing at all, but I'm getting those vibes. I think it's so very cool. I'm going to go back one more time. Side note, you hear how the audience clap is happening later than the beat here? <laughs> This is one of those things on opera stages that singers have to watch out for if they're in a really big hall. A lot of times the sound of the orchestra is channeled out towards the audience. And so when it bounces off of the back of the hall and then reaches a singer on stage, if the singer sings with that sound, they're too late. So in a similar way, if they listen to an audience clapping along with an aria, which doesn't happen very much in opera, but it can, um, often that beat if they sing along with that, they're late as well. And you can hear the, the lateness here. So instead, you have to be keyed into the conductor waving his hands and not listen to your ears. Go with the conductor's hands. I'm sure with these guys, uh, they can listen to their fellows on stage. They're all there together. But in-ear monitors have made a huge difference in keeping everyone together now. <sighs> tempo. 
sounds like he's up to something. <laughs> Absolutely. Feels like it's from another time and culture. I love it. It's so out there. I love that they made this popular, right? This is a big song. I've heard the name before. I just, whoa, the, the guts to put this inside of a, a rock song. I guess this is very progressive, but the guts to do that and say, no, 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 we're going to, we're going to bring this to the table. People are going to love this. Whoa. I can't imagine going to the label and saying, this is, this is going to be a big song. Wow. <laughs> That's so cool. On top of that, his vocalizations, they are so sensual. Whoa. Whoa. I mean, I think vocalizations, primitive vocalizations, we're probably trying to communicate a lot of basic things and basic needs. So it makes sense that we would go there with that kind of vocalization. But, oh my gosh, I love it. It's so cool. And then all of the other sounds from the band are just amazing. Oh, like, I really feel like their conversations with people. Conversations between band members. Wow. This is definitely about lovemaking. I was hesitant to say it before because I thought, ah, oh, it could just be sensual. No, it's it's lovemaking. The stand, the movements, the everything. <laughs> right. Ah, uh, yeah. A whole lot of love. Of course it's about lovemaking. <laughs> oh my goodness. I try to keep things super PG on this channel. This is not PG. <laughs> In a lot of ways, this feels like free jazz to me in the way that you have instruments can just kind of go off and, and jam and expand on ideas without really feeling too hooked in to a, spe a specific harmonic structure or even there is a rhythmic structure that's been established, but it's not feeling like a specific time signature to me. Again, very, very free. Nice. Oh, I really love that re-entry. The, the guitar is, it just is really enervating. I like that a ton. And, and then I also love the way that the drums are sort of echoing and, and having this boom, boom between that gets that energized. It makes us excited to essentially have a return to, I would say, the main body of the song. I'm very curious how long that improvisational section lasts on the record. This is a live performance. Often bands will go into more depth 
during the improvisational time in live performances. So I'm curious how long the original track is and what it sounds like. I'm gonna go listen to it after this. <laughs> funny cross-legged thing on stage. I have no idea why. That's not normally considered a great stance for supporting your voice, but I mean, he's obviously doing great. So, I mean, there are tons of ways to help people sing better, but sometimes people don't need those. They, they just have got it. There are always things you can do to up it, but... Apparently, he didn't need to have a horse stance, like a Bruce Dickinson kind of horse stance, which really gets you in the stage. He's like, oh, I'm going to do a cross-legged thing. Wow. Wow. This is one of the most sensual songs I know of. <laughs> Wow. It's so fascinating to me how non-specific he is about his pitches, but specifically non-specific. He could sing everything exactly on pitch if he wanted to, but instead he puts in tons of slides. Sometimes he purposely goes flat, sometimes purposely sharp as methods of expression, which is fantastic. Thank you so much for not just being melodined. Song, baby. <laughs> so the A between the two B's, right? That is one one sound that's actually two vowels combined together. B, right? A, and he's deliberately separating those. There's, was there even a little H between? Yeah. He's even putting a little H in between that to accent the difference between the two vowels. <laughs> uh, I love it when singers use diphthongs to their advantage. I think he's using this as a way to call out to the audience and make that diphthong separation really easy to catch onto. By the way, I think we have shirts now in our store that say keep calm and diphthong. That was by request from all of you. They are up. You're welcome. And thank you. I really love that shirt. <laughs> Okay, okay. <laughs> there is another little pre sound that he added in here, which happens a lot of times with a B. A B is a bilabial consonant, meaning you make it with your two lips. B, right? It's right there. Two lips, they go together. Uh, an M is made in a similar way. Uh, the B just happens quicker, essentially, and you sing through the M a little bit longer. So sometimes if you want to get things moving before you sing a B, you can put an M before it, which happens right here. Mbehibe. That one's clear. There's your M. <laughs> right? Once you hear it, you can't not hear it. Baby. Yeah, you got it. Ooh. Ooh. 
Right? That's steamy. Uh, a lot of the sounds he's picking, the mmm and the oo and the b, all of those are deeper sounds within our vocal tract as well. Oo is considered a very deep, darker vowel. A closed vowel, it lets the sound marinate back here more. And mmm also has a similar thing where it, it brings the sound, it redirects it back, and it actually goes back up through your nasal passage. It's a nasal consonant. Uh, and that lets it marinate more. All of these sounds often can be more associated with like an inner kind of feeling, which makes sense for the sensuality of the song. Oh, I want to go back a little bit more so you can hear some of those choices. Even that is fairly dark. Such a good top. Gosh, I love the way he played with the audience in that pause there, the way he drew it out, engaged with them as well. That was so cool. And then the way he purposely used his break up, that's something that Jeff Buckley does as well. I can see that inspiration and that correlation now. Uh, ugh, it's so good. And man, the top and the distortion he adds up there, it's beautiful. Oh, back a little further. There's the break. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good. No. I love that slide up. Ugh. Oh my goodness. The way they bring it home is so good. Wow. Wow. As a <laughs> very explicit, explicitly about love, <laughs> love making. Wow, wow. They uh, they put it all out there, don't they? <laughs> Wow, my goodness, this song is definitely about one thing and one thing only. shift is that moving to the next song Ooh, ooh, that was a really cool shift at the end that song is wild uh probably one of the most sensual songs i've ever heard incredible uh <laughs> i felt myself blush a few times I think the camera probably caught that. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if you want to check out that Deconstructing Jeff Buckley video, there's a link over here. It's really cool to draw these correlations now between Robert Plant and Jeff Buckley. I'm just, I'm delighted 
to get to do that now. Thank you, everyone. And may you fall more in love with music every day.